The best part about disaster shows is that you don't actually have to live them. The good ones show the real terror of a gory disease, or they bombard you with hordes of ravenous undead. And all that grabs onto your amygdala and yanks on your entire limbic system. You feel the fear and hopelessness, and you ask yourself, would I just make the best out of life in a Fedra QZ, or would I be a firefly? Then you just go back to watching Ted Lasso. But the great ones do something else. They do something bigger. They make you wonder whether the attempts at the cure are actually worse than the disease. When we're faced with catastrophe, how often do we make it worse? So slap on your hazmat suit, spin the cylinder of your Colt Python, and let's fight to survive in the post-apocalyptic wasteland of the unseen. Look, we've got to talk about details from The Last of Us, The Walking Dead, Contagion, Outbreak, just letting you know up front. You get a sense of whether the immediate reaction in the wake of Cordyceps is worth it the second a soldier gets orders to fire on Joel, Tommy, and Sarah, just in case they might be infected. Martial law is instituted immediately, and 20 years later, the Federal Disaster Response Agency still controls every dismal element of daily life. In a crisis, it feels like you should turn to the government. I mean, isn't that what they're there for? It's a mainstay of every movie and show plot for a reason. The worse it gets, the more people want centralized aid on a grand sweeping scale. They need help. But sometimes, and a lot of the time, that yields perfectly predictable consequences. In The Last of Us, the authorities' initial reaction to a crisis was the indiscriminate bombing of major cities to hopefully contain or destroy the fungus. These are cities full of perfectly healthy, innocent people. In the 1995 film Outbreak, a monkey mutates and infects a town in California. Well, the solution? Blow it up! You gotta break a few eggs, right? And if that kind of response sounds like an extreme measure that just would not happen in real life, ask the residents of West Philadelphia. In 1985, the Philadelphia PD dropped bombs out of a helicopter onto a building containing members of MOVE, a black liberation organization. The resulting fire eventually destroyed 61 neighboring homes over two city blocks, and it left hundreds homeless. Oh, and the remains of two girls ages 12 and 14 were taken by the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology to be used in a course on forensics without anybody's consent. The families were never contacted. And how well did the FBI and ATF handle Waco? But it's not just the impersonal, large-scale interventions to problems. World War Z, The Walking Dead, we see the military shooting people who don't make the cutoff for camps and just dumping their bodies in mass graves. We're not going to go into detail about all the real-life examples of that. Look, when you're in the hammer business and you're the most prodigious and efficient wielder of hammers and a crisis seems to call for the hammer brigade, every individual becomes a nail. And the more the problem escalates, the harder they swing. But the treatment of science in these shows is what really hits home. Sometimes science is the only hope left, whether it's an immune Ellie or protecting Eugene for reasons that nobody fully understands. There's an almost religious commitment to maintaining that hope. And sometimes the science is actually pretty realistic. In 2011's Contagion, Elliot Gould plays Dr. Ian Sussman. He's researching a cure for a virus that is extremely contagious, and it's transmitted by respiratory droplets and airborne particles, which Gwyneth Paltrow's character acquires on a business trip to Hong Kong. Ooh, this one is a little bit on the nose. Well, the CDC says the virus is too dangerous to study outside the government's most secure labs. But by disobeying that order, Dr. Sussman grows the virus in cells, and that leads to a vaccine. We just saw an eerily similar process play out over the last few years. The most likely path to a solution is to have lots of different people working on the problem, and no centralized authority can plan exactly where that solution is going to come from. Stringent control over thoughts and actions just doesn't work. In his landmark book, The Wisdom of Crowds, James Surowiecki breaks down why that process worked so well with the SARS virus two decades ago. In February 2003, no one had ever even seen SARS. But decentralizing research among a global network of labs, each of whom maintained their independence, led to isolating the virus within two months. Surowiecki concludes that diversity of thought, coordination, and aggregating knowledge is good. And a mix of groupthink, knee-jerk reactions, and tight controls is a recipe for failure. That should be clearer now more than ever. And the weird thing is that the World Health Organization did it exactly right with SARS in 2003, and then, well, you know. 
Terrifying problems like Contagion's Virus, The Fungus and The Last of Us, Outbreak's Mutated Monkey, and the entire zombie infection spectrum don't necessitate equally terrifying solutions. We recognize the horrors of indiscriminate barbarism throughout the 20th century. Mao's Great Leap Forward, Pol Pot ravaging Cambodia, Stalin's purges, gulags, and famines, the bombing of Dresden, and the decision to use the atomic bomb in Japan. We know that handing over authority to the world's most blunt instruments causes widespread suffering. But in every crisis, whether it's fictional or real, we keep doing the same thing. We also know where the heroes and solutions come from. Individuals and small groups who do their best to balance the severity of a problem with the real-life consequences of solving it. The future will be filled with crises and disasters. Some we've had before and others we can't even fathom yet. This is unavoidable. But when the next one happens, and it will, we can look to our thought experiments in fiction and our lived real-life experience to do a better job of answering the most difficult question a society will ever face. What do we do now?